Now you can start recording. We are on. So, good evening, dear friends. Greetings from Indian Arthroplasty Association, and welcome to the <clears throat> live IAA 360 degree webinar series number 20. My name is Subransu Mohanty. I'm the present president of the Indian Arthroplasty Association. We started in 1995, and we completed 25 years in 2020 last year. Under the shadow of the pandemic, we celebrated our Silver Jubilee, but it, the celebration will end in a Silver Jubilee conference that is IAA Con 2021, which will be held next month, you know, from 22nd to 24th of October at Renaissance Convention Center at Mumbai. I request all of you to register to have a great academic extravaganza. Our uh, organizing secretary, Dr. Asista, will tell you detail about the conference a little later. Now you can get details about the conference as well as our association at indianarthroplastyassociation.com. And if you have any suggestions, please email at indianarthroplasty at gmail.com or in my personal email ID, Dr. S.S. at hotmail.com. Dear friends, we have made two WhatsApp groups for our live members only, IA1 and IA2. If you are a life member and if you are not a member of this WhatsApp group, any of one of these WhatsApp groups, then please message me in my number 9869794189 and I will put you in one of these groups. Today, this is the 20th webinar you know, in its uh, series. And today the webinar is devoted to approaches to total knee arthroplasty. Now, with the demand from our youngsters, our fellows, and our residents, we selected this topic, Approaches to Total Knee Arthroplasty. We had already done a webinar on Approaches to Total Hip Arthroplasty, and today it will be entirely devoted only to the Approaches to Total Knee Arthroplasty. And today our convener is none other than Dr. Bikas Kapoor, who is a joint replacement and arthroscopic surgeon, and as well as the vice chairman of, and group director of Medica Institute of Orthopedic Sciences at Kolkata, India. And as I told you that uh, we hold our webinars every third Saturday of every month in the evening. And today being the third Saturday, it is, the, it is our IA webinar. 
Now, in addition to Dr. Kapoor and myself, we have a you know galaxy of uh, faculty from all over the India, and they will be discussing about various approaches. We have Dr. Nilan Sa, you know, better known as Subhastas Approach Surgeon. Nilan Mai doesn't need any introduction. You know, he's attached to Bombay Hospital and various other hospitals in Mumbai, but he's better known as Subhastas Surgeon. Welcome. Dr. Nilan Sa to our webinar. Thank you for joining. Thank you. Dr. Asit Sa, who is our executive committee member, and as well as he's the organizing secretary for IA Con 2021 Silver Jubilee Conference. He is from Technic uh, Clinic from Mumbai, and he will discuss about private vector approach. Welcome, Dr. Asit Sa. Uh, thanks, Subhanshu. Uh, Dr. Manuz Wadwa. He is the chairman and director of elite group of uh, you know orthopedics hospitals uh, in Punjab, and uh, he will uh, discuss about the lateral approach. Welcome, Dr. Manoj Wadhwa, to the webinar today. Thank you, Doctor N. Rajkumar is a senior consultant orthoplasty surgeon at Ganga Hospital, Coimbatore, and also he is our executive committee member, and uh, he will discuss about tibial tubercle osteotomy and its pros and cons. Welcome Dr. Rajkumar today to the webinar. Dr. Rajiv Sharma, who is uh, you know, our president elect and he will take over from me next month in our conference. He will discuss about difficult exposures, cordyceps, knees and spill. All these things you know, will give way a total patpuri of approaches to the total knee orthoplasty. Today's webinar is supported by academic grants from Smith and Nephew and we thank Smith and Nephew for their generous, generous grant for this webinar. Before we, I hand over to Dr. Bikas Kapoor, there are certain disclaimers. In view of stringent patient privacy laws in the country, any breach of confidentiality of patient information during the course of this clinical meeting would be the complete responsibility of the presenter. The Indian Orthoplasty Association would not be held liable in case such a breach were to occur during the meeting or from viewership of the proceedings of the meeting in the near and distant future. And last, a digital online platform is connectivity dependent. We would request the participants to kindly bear with us in case of an inadvertent and technical failure hindering the connectivity of our meeting. We express our sincere regrets in the event of such an occurrence during the meeting. Now, without much ado, now I hand over the proceedings to Dr. Vikas Kapoor to go ahead with the proceedings of the webinar. Over to Vikas, please. Thank you, uh, Shubhran, uh, sir. Uh, this is a great uh, opportunity, uh, I think, from a very dynamic president. Even when we had a very, very strong and difficult time in last uh, one, year, one year or so, uh, Subhran Shubhai has been an exemplary leader in his capacity. Conducting 20 webinars is not a joke. And uh, a mere mortal like me sort of looks up at him and sees how he works so hard and does so much for academics. Uh, congratulations to you, Subhran Shubhai. You've been a wonderful and an exemplary uh, leader indeed. And I'm sure uh, coming forward, uh, Rajiv Sharma, Professor uh, Dr. Rajiv Sharma and my other colleagues are, of course, going to be greatly indebted to you for what you are doing for the Arthroplasty Society as a whole. And uh, without much ado, again, I have the honor of uh, this webinar was conceptualized by Dr. Mohanty and uh, he gave uh, me this responsibility. Although I may not have been up to his standards of uh, getting people over and a bit late and laggard on this, but uh, thankfully I have been able to uh, uh, muster up enough uh, galaxy of people whom I respect and regard in my own colleagues. So. Uh, so Branshubai has been kind enough to speak and open up the uh, you know innings with the most commonly practiced approach. Probably 90% of our work is done through this approach, and the nuances of talking about it is not going to be easy because the most easily done and most commonly done is the most difficult to talk about. And I am sure our president would do the great honors to do this approach, medial parapatellar approach. I would ask Subranshubai to start the webinar at this point of time. Uh, you can start sharing your screen. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, 
thank you vikas uh, that's a great introduction thanks for uh, you know all your hard work uh, you know which uh, we are going to present today all of us together so let me start with the parapetler approach which is you know commonly done by most of the orthoplasty surgeons when they do, they, they do a primary total knee replacement for a varus or a valgus knee now most of us do not know parapetler approach is also known as bun langenbeck approach even i didn't know i got it to know when i was going through this approach through last couple of days while preparing this lecture so this is von langenbeck approach just for your knowledge now patient positioning that this is the position of the patient which most of the surgeons follow and i would recommend that who are beginning their knee orthoplasty surgery they should position their patient like this there should be foot support and there should be a lateral thigh support because when the knee should be kept flexed on the you know table because when you keep the knee flexed then the vessels they remain away from the bone and it is easier to operate ar around this area and to release the soft tissue structures either medially or laterally whatever moreover it is easy to dislocate the knee as well so most of us we operate in this position so keep the knee flexed and keep it flexed about say 60 to 90 degrees something in between we should not acutely flex the knee to the 30 degree or 40 degree it should be somewhere between 60 to 90 degree there is a comfortable position some surgeons they put another foot support here so that to keep the knee whenever required little more extender or little more flexed but for me it is comfortable with one support only so i operate in this position and lateral thigh support that reduces on assistant there and that keeps the leg in position normally i use a tunique because that makes my surgery easier but you know nowadays people are moving towards uh, you know operating without tunique because tunique induces hypoxia hypoxia induces endothelial damage and that may lead to more of you know dvt or pe so dr ranawat prefers you know now without tunique some surgeons also raise the tunique only while cementing but i do the entire surgery under tunique but before closure i release the tunique to check for the bleeders and then i close my you know um, knee so remember in this position that uh, the vessels remain away and it's easier to operate but if you are going through this and if you are taking the cuts the moment you come across this fat pad there is always a fat pad remains in front of these vessels you have to be extremely careful don't go beyond this fat pad otherwise you are likely to injure the vessels so always remember everywhere in the body around the neurovascular bundle there is always a fat pad so whenever you come across a fat pad be careful that there might be you know some vital structures behind now we take a intra midline incision usually the incision extends about 5 cm above the pat line you go down and when you go down please remember don't put the incision directly on the tibial tuberosity because that may become painful because of this bony prominence so you have to take the incision little away from the tibial tuberosity and put the incision like this so put a intra medial incision and then move it little away from the tibial tuberosity medially but if you move too much away remember there is the infra patellar branch of the saphenous nerve so if you move too much away then you are likely to injure the infra patellar branch of the saphenous nerve and that will lead to you know paresthesia and uh, anesthesia on the lateral aspect of the knee because it supplies from medial to lateral aspect and uh, you might have seen some of the patient uh, take care patients after surgery they complain of the paresthesia of course that disappears in about 3 uh, to 6 months time but remember if you have inadvertent inadvertently injured this intrapatellar branch of saphenous nerve don't try to repair it rather you just pull it and cut it and bury it inside the muscle or somewhere because it may cause a painful neuroma and sometimes we have seen the patients coming after surgery complaining the pain around the upper part of the medial condyle of tibia when you press that there is always tenderness there so be careful about this nerve so put the incision straight go little medially to the tibial tuberosity next when you you know go inside the knee when you do a parapetal approach then just put a neck at the you know supero medial aspect of the patella here you just put a neck and then you extend the incision proximally as well as distally but remember while you you know extend this incision see that about 2 to 3 mm cuff of the quadriceps tendon might be remaining you know medially 
and rest of the quadriceps tendon here. Do not enter the tendon muscular or musculotendinous interval because it's always tendon to tendon healing is better. And hence you have to keep a two to three millimeter cuff of tissue, you know, cuff of quadriceps tendon attached to the muscle here on the medial side. On this side also, just see that two to three millimeter of you know, quadriceps tendon is beyond the patella. Otherwise, you cannot close it properly and it will be difficult during the closure. Moreover, when you come here, then superiorly elevate it or if you are not able to elevate it superiorly because osteoporotic bone or anything is there, then what you can do, you can take a 15 number knife, just peel it over. The meticulousness of your peeling over this upper part of medial condyle of the tibia soft tissues will aid in a meticulous closure and complete closure of the capsule while doing the closure, then there will not be any oozing here. Otherwise, sometimes if you're not close this part properly, post-operative oozing continues in this place and that may lead to a post-operative infection as well. And after that, then you can make the knee straight, then evert the patella, okay? Then you flex the knee. And while everting the patella, remember the patella tendon is attached to a tibial tuberosity, so you can with your knife, uh, you can just peel it up a little bit here and then flex the knee. I'll show you in a video later on. So this is the video of medial parapetal approach. This is a five minutes video, which was shown in one of the Ranavat meetings uh, once. So those who have seen earlier, you can bear with me. So this is the medial parapetal approach where you leave a cuff of uh, you know, tissues there. This is a knee which is partially correctable virus. Always examine the knee under anesthesia, whether it is fully correctable, partially correctable, or it is a fixed virus or fixed valgus. So that will aid you because under anesthesia, you can assess it better. So this is anterior midline approach. So when you put the in the lower part, you put it little, you know, medial to the tibial tuberosity. Next, you cast the bleeders. And as I told you that at the superomedial aspect of the patella, you make a nick there. There the sinual fluid will gush out there. So put your suction there. Next, you cut the you know, quadriceps tendon, keeping two to three millimeters medially attached to the quadriceps muscle. Then you curve it on the medial side of the patella gradually. Then you go to the you know, upper part of the tibia. And there you put the incision little deep so that you, you know, Incise the periosteum there, uh, there, so you go soft periosteally. And this has to be lifted soft periosteally here at this place. So here with the knife, uh, taking out the periosteum, this is your periosteum. If the periosteum is not good, I couldn't lift it properly with the periosteum. So I take 15 number blade now. So we peel that, sub, you know, all this soft tissue sub periosteally from the upper part of the tibia. Then your future closure will be much easier. So you use this type of uh, you know collateral ligaments, which is very thin. So that will retract. As you can see here, how superiorly it has been elevated everything. So here you excise the deep medial collateral ligament, which is attached to the margin of the tibia, deep medial collateral ligament. Now you take out your osteophytes, water osteophytes, and take out the meniscus. While taking out the meniscus, remember about a, you know, one or two millimeter meniscus should be attached to the soft tissues there, otherwise you are likely to injure the medial collateral ligament. Then you take out those osteophytes on the femoral side and remember while taking out the osteophytes here also, you may injure the medial epicondyle. As you can see here that after taking out the osteophytes, how the MCL was lax there. Now with the back of the knife, <clears throat> the knife should face away from the patella tendon. You just release it upper part of the carefully, and then you try to evert the patella and then you know flex the knee. Sometimes it is difficult to evert the patella. You may have to excise the part of the infrapatellar fat pad. So the partial excision of infrapatellar fat pad can lead to eversion of the patella. So here it is difficult to evert, so we subluxate the patella. If you want, you can extend your incision proximally in order to evert, the, evert that patella further. Or else in revision cases, we can do a quadriceps snip or any tight knees, we can do a quadriceps snip. If the ACL is not degenerated and you can excise the ACL, I do normally posterior cruciate substituting design. So I excise my posterior cruciate at the beginning of my surgery. Sometimes there are intercondylar osteophytes on the femur. So you can excise those things before cutting the cruciates. Then you 
put it and do a Ransel's maneuver in order to dislocate the knee. That means you flex and externally rotate the tibia in order to dislocate the knee. This is how his knee is dislocated. Again, the part, you know, infrapatellar part part partially you can excise in order to expose the lateral condyle of the tibia. So you release some of the soft tissue structure there and excise the osteophytes. Now we have put our joint in. So before the closer, I you know release the tunique, then check the bleeders. And while closing, after putting the drain tube, first again take the stitch at the superomedial part of the patella where we had put the first incision. There you close it in extension, take one stitch, one or two stitches, and then you flex and then close the rest of the cordyceps. So always the closer has to be done in flexion. So you put intermittent sutures there. After putting intermittent sutures, then you take a continuous locking suture. So always remember do a two layers of the suture because that is the most important quadriceps, you know, and capsule because below that only joint, there is not much uh, soft tissues in the knee like the hip joint. So we make two layers of the suture, intermittent and then continuous. Then you do subcutaneous closure and of course then the skin. So that completes your surgery. So take home message, this is the commonest approach for total knee orthoplasty. Patient positioning knee should be flexed with foot and thigh support. Skin incision, put just medial to tibial tuberosity. Two to three millimeter cough of cordyceps tendon medially for the closer. We need to release the deep medial collateral ligament which is attached to the margin of the tibia. Ransel's maneuver by flexing and externally rotating the tibia to dislocate the knee. You should do a closer inflection and always put two layers of sutures to close the quadriceps on continuous one intermittent layer followed by a continuous locking one. I thank you for a patient hearing. Thank you, uh, Subranshubai. That was uh, lucidly explained. A uh, very uh, commonly practiced approach, uh, but uh, very very finer points have been brought out. I think there would be questions which uh, we would discuss at the end if, uh, as and when the time comes. But if there are any issues amongst the panelists, they can also pop up once in a while if they want to talk about something. Uh, I don't see anything much in the chat box. I think there is something. Uh, yeah, okay. So that's okay. The recording seems to have stopped. Can you hear Sup me? Sapnil. Sapnil. Hello. The recording has stopped. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm just checking this. So, uh, okay. yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, now without much ado, I would invite the champion of champions in Subvastas approach, whom we have heard in various meetings. It's an honor to have you, Dr. Nilensha. Thank you for joining us. And uh, we would like to hear you, uh, your favorite uh, approach. I think the only approach probably you've used for a very long time. It would be great to have you over and talk about the subvastas and nuances. Thank you very much. Over to you, thank Dr. You. Thank you, Dr. Vikas. And uh, thank you to the Indian Arthroplasty Association uh, for giving me this opportunity, probably on the umpteenth time. Uh, it just goes to show the interest that people have in the subvastas approach. Uh, a brief introduction, I think I have not used any other approach to the knee since the year 2006. And uh, there was a little mention by Dr. Mohanty about tunique. I have not applied the tunique since 2008. So it's now around 12 years or 11, 13 years without tunique and 15 years of the subvastus approach. And uh, I have not really found any real reason to change. But as we heard uh, a very lucid lecture about the medial parapatella, so subvastus friends is still not mainstream. There is a perception that it does not offer any major advantage. It is believed that it is a very limited exposure. It seems difficult and requires patient selection. 
it is thought that replacing the patella is very very difficult so why do it but i would put it to you that as we have seen dr mohanty explaining the medial parapatellar approach so the approach inferior to the patella whether it is subvastus or parapatellar is the same but superior to the patella you will go into the subvastus plane and retract this whole quadriceps muscle laterally so what is extremely important is the mobility of the patella what is important is the range of movement that the person has and that will tell you how easy or how difficult the surgery is going to be so the stiffer the patient the more difficult is the approach the shorter the patient uh, milan the shorter the no the video is not working okay. i'm sorry the slides yeah. Yeah, your slides. Uh, your share the screen sharing has stopped. It seems. Uh, well, can't see the screen. Can you just? Uh, yeah, no, no. We can see you. Yeah, if you can just stop sharing and uh, share again uh, your screen. Okay, just one minute. Let me see. Can you see the screen now? No. Uh, no, sir. Okay. Just bear with me. can hear me yes we can see and hear you but we can't see the stream so it was visible just now it went out i think i'll probably need some help here huh? because i can't really let me see the share uh time share again sir your presentation Air screen. Yeah. Yeah. Now you are good. Now I am good. Yeah. Oh. Just bear with me again. so subvastus approach was described in the german literature more than 100 years ago hoffman described it in the english literature in 1991 and as i briefly mentioned i have been using it since 2006 tourniquet less since 2008 including revisions and i would have probably used it more than 30 uh, 13000 times so the key points in surgery is that you need to have an adequate anterior incision with a slight medial bias you raise the medial flap until the vastus medialis and the vastus medialis obliquus are clearly seen you do an inverted l shaped capsulotomy subluxate the patella in the lateral gutter and then only you flex the knee so each step in surgery should make your subsequent step easier and you are aiming for a sequential rather than simultaneous exposure of the knee so this i would just share a video of a patient that i operated so there is no tunique the knee has been injected with lignocaine adrenaline and hyalase i have taken a fairly adequate anterior incision and you can see even without tunique at least in the skin and subcutaneous tissue because of the pre injection of lox with adrenaline and hyalase there isn't much bleeding i have divided the deep fascia and now i am injecting a little bit of saline adrenaline just over the quadriceps and i am using this mop to bluntly peel off the tissue from the quadriceps muscle all this is done in flexion now i have extended the knee use this skin hooks 
I feel skin hooks are extremely important and you must get these out from the plastic surgery set. Here you are looking at the quadriceps muscle. I am dissecting it with scissors and essentially I am releasing the quadriceps from the medial intermuscular septum. So I've released it such that I can put my finger underneath the quadriceps and I am reflecting the quadriceps laterally. So two Langenbeck retractors. Here you can see, here you can see that this is retracting the quadriceps laterally. This is re retracting the soft tissues medially. This is the subvastus plane. This is the patella and this is the lower end. And here there will be the patella tendon. So now I am doing, going to be doing an inverted L-shaped capsulotomy. So the lower incision is the same as it would be in a medial parapatellar approach. There is no tunique. So there are these brisk bleeders, which I will just actually clamp with hemostats. In fact, I don't even cauterize them. I just leave the hemostats on for a little while. And now this is the the inverted L of the capsulotomy. So that has been done. And this patella is subluxed in the lateral gutter. Here, what you are looking at is the synovium, anterior synovium. So I'm taking this incision deep and I will be raising the whole medial flap. So this retractor Homan's retractor has gone on to the lateral side of the femur. This is the anterior suprapatellar pouch and synovium. Sometimes this is very, very thick. And I would be releasing or not releasing, removing this whole flap so that there is no difficulty in excursion of the quadriceps. Now, having done that, Having done this, I have now flexed the knee. This is still an extension. The patella is subluxed in the lateral gutter. Now I have flexed the knee. You can see the worn out medial condyle. Here, this is the medial meniscus, which is still there. I will be dividing the anterior horn of the medial meniscus and would be raising this medial flap sharply of the medial side of the tibia with a knife. And after having done this, I would use the periosteum to elevate the medial soft tissues of the proximal tibia, quite similar to what Dr. Mohanty had shown. I like to keep a mop there and then elevate it like this as it is being seen so that the likelihood of damage to the medial periosteum is not there. Now I have put the limb in a figure of four position. This mop is still there and I would be putting a home and retractor onto the proximal tibia, stretching the tissues on the medial side. And here again, you can see this whole quadriceps, which is intact. And I will be erasing the deep MCL from the proximal tibia. And here you can see the whole knee exposed through the subvastus approach. After having taken the distal femoral cut, I would, I would expose the proximal tibia. So the key points in surgery are, just one minute, this seems to have, Here we have exposed the whole knee, as you can see here. And I would expose the proximal tibia and subluxate it after the distal femoral cut has been taken. Removal of this lateral meniscus in total would imply a proper exposure. And here you can see that even with a spacer, the patellar tracking is absolutely intact. 
exposure of the patella is difficult but you can it expose it like this remove the soft tissues from the superior aspect and the inferior aspect of the patella and here you can see that the patella has been resurfaced and with a cemented component and this is after the closure you see full extension full flexion without any stuttering or lateral tilting of the patella so resurfacing of the patella in total knee is a little bit debatable minor patella trackings mal trackings are better tolerated if resurfaced but the subvastus approach can give you absolutely anatomical patellofemoral joints without any tilting whatsoever so the advantage that i found is that most people are able to elevate their leg without any lag within a few hours post surgery most people are able to walk on the same day of surgery and some are able to go home the same day but 95% of my patients go home the next day and a lot of them start climbing stairs and descending stairs in one or two days and walk with a reciprocal gait around 3 out of 10 knees are able to flex fully and the flexion that is achieved is also kinematically correct so what is so different i think immaculate patella tracking is a huge advantage mobilization of the quadriceps is built in so if you are operating on a stiff knee unless you mobilize the quads well you just can't do the surgery so eventually you will get a better range of movement lesser bleeding it is less painful quads recovery is better so this is even more advantageous in more difficult knees assessment of flexion extension gaps because your quadriceps is intact is easier femoral rotation becomes not so critical but eventually it will give you more flexion and i believe it is physiological i will just point out one review article in the journal of arthroplasty where they did an overview of randomized control trials in total knee arthroplasty what have we learned and the only you know uh, randomized trial between medial parapatellar and subvastus approach showed that there is better early out outcomes with subvastus approach earlier return of straight leg raise lower consumption of opiates less blood loss greater knee flexion at one week you may say that how does it matter but i think we are living in a competitive world and what the patient can do 4 hours after surgery 10 hours after surgery on the evening of surgery on the next day of surgery also matters so what is our experience in different knees we have commented of about our experience in obese patients in valgus knees in stiff knees and all this is published literature even in revision knees post op bruising is common we don't use drains it can be extensive so patients need to be forewarned in conclusion and my take home message is that subvastus approach can offer faster recovery may help in achieving better flexion surgical technique is important but it remains my approach of choice for practically all the knees i thank you for your attention thank you very much uh, dr shah it was as usual a uh, relevation seeing this talk which we have seen several times also but every time you keep adding something some extra to did bits to the talk which i can see <laughs> and uh, you actually are a star of subvastus approach congratulations and uh, uh, this uh, then it falls on me to talk about uh, the midvastus approach which is i would say 5% behind dr shah so it's not really i'm not uh, a great proponent of each i have 
uh, sort of been using all approaches as uh, horses for courses situation. So I would not really say and put my neck out and say that uh, I would do this only. But yes, I would say that uh, it is an approach of choice when we are looking at uh, those advantages which Dr. Shah had discussed regarding the subvastus approach. Midvastus comes quite close to subvastus approach. And since he has already so nicely talked about all the advantages, etc., I knew which he would. I have not made a presentation which is very long. I would make it short with my responsibility as a convener. So I would uh, share my screen, I'm sure. I think all of you can see it now. And uh, so this is about the midvastus approach, which is quite close to the subvastus approach, as Dr. Shah has just said. So it was again first described by Eng and Parks in 1990. It's a compromise between the medial parapetlar and subvastus approach. It's obviously more quad sparing. It doesn't cut into the rectus muscle than standard medial parapetlar approach. And of course, the retraction of patella is slightly easier in untrained hands like ours where you are afraid you don't have much of flexion, you have a compromise on the deep flexion and stiffer knee compared to a fully flexible knee, which initially people want to do for subvastus approach. Uh, so uh, the technique is the same, the midline incision and the dissection is carried out into the subcutaneous tissue. The VMO is exposed. In the direction of the fibers identified about two to four centimeter incision is made and it's specialized. Basically, what we are doing here is uh, we are carrying out a similar incision below upwards up to the uh, proximal two third of the pole of patella. And the proximal most north pole of patella, you take about uh, 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 10 o'clock to 10.30 position in the uh, sort of uh, left knee and uh, maybe 230 position on the right knee, and then you start splitting the uh, vastus fibers, as you can see. The arthrotomy proceeds distally along the medial border of patella, cutting the capsule up to tibial tuberosity. Most of the VMO, including entire portion attached to the quadriceps tendon, is preserved. And since we are just kind of opening up, splitting the uh, patella, uh, the VMO, on the uh, in the direction of the fibers, we are not cutting anything at all. So we are basically making a nick at uh, the midpoint of from 9 o'clock to 12 o'clock position. And then we are splitting the VMO on that direction. So it's easier retraction of patella here. In fact, before even we start the surgery and we take out lateral meniscus, we can actually, as you can see, avert the patella. So one small advantage uh, over... Uh, uh, so, uh, subvastus approaches. And of course, I uh, have not done a tourniquet surgery for last 10, 12 years now, uh, which was in initial eight years, 10 years when we started TK, we used to do. So since 2008, I have not used to, it's in nine probably, I have not used tourniquet. And uh, this tourniquet usage has gone down more because of these approaches. And of course, the flexion approach, which Dr. Mohanty talked about. So easier retraction of patella compared to the subvastus approach. The advantages, of course, are that uh, we do spare a lot more uh, artery. We, if we cut in the right direction, probably we'll spare the medial genicular artery. But in any approach in TKR, you usually end up uh, damaging inferior medial genicular artery, which you can't really do much about. The drawback, of course, is uh, that there is a potential denervation of VMO sometimes. There are transient TMG changes which have come out in old studies, but these are very, very uh, rare, uh, very, very subtle. The contraindication is that uh, the knees having less than 70 to 80 degrees of flexion, obesity, and previous HTOs. So here I would uh, kind of uh, start this uh, small video, a step-by-step -step approach. Uh, so as you can see here, it's a straightforward, uh, simple incision. Uh, just like any other uh, surgery, this is being done uh, without a tourniquet. So there would be some amount of uh, bleed there. And uh, as we proceed, we just dissect through the plane of the tissue in the subcutaneous area. And once we open it up, 
as you can see, we find out where we, uh, from the below upwards up to the just before reaching the pole of the patella on the medial aspect, superior pole, we will mark out a place from where we will take a neck uh, superiorly and obliquely. I do use uh, electrocautery, which helps me in reducing the bleed because I'm operating without to nicket. And here I have marked two points. One is at uh, three o'clock and one is at 12 o'clock. And in between these two points, exactly at the bisecting area of this point, from where the fiber, we, I trace the fibers of uh, vastus medialis obliquus. And then with a small nick there, I would take a scissor eventually and split it across, as you can see here. So the scissor is taken and it is dissected. So the VMO is getting dissected. It is not being cut. You know, it is, it is not cut. It is dissected out. And then with a finger, usually, or with a blunt instrument, or even with the blunt edge of the scissor, we just split up and it, it opens up, just like uh, uh, VMO, uh, you know, elevating approach. Uh, so if your knee is very stiff and you are not very confident of doing a subvastus approach, but still you want to preserve more than three-fourths of uh, vastus uh, function, you would rather have a compromise between these two. And that's where a lot of surgeons would prefer doing, for regularity's sake, a mid approach, where they are not very confident of either doing, they don't want to do a parapatler, and they don't want to, they are not confident of elevating or, or uh, retracting patella in a sub approach. As you can see, it is being bluntly dissected upwards along the direction of the fiber, without actually cutting a single fiber of the VMO. So that is the most important part of this approach, the use of fingers to clear the synovium below. A bit of synovium cutting is necessary sometimes to make the patella free and in order to reduce the additions. And eventually you will find that the patella can actually sometimes, most of the times, if you want to evert the patella, you can actually evert the patella in this approach where in subvastus approach, you tend to subluxate the patella initially and then take a bit more of releases and cuts as you go up. And uh, after cutting your distal femur, it is easier to avert the patella, especially in slightly stiffer knees. So just a small minor point, I think, rather than uh, having any criticism for anything, these approaches have with their own issues. Each approach has its own personal plus, plus and minus disadvantages and advantages. The medial side opening up, the standard releases on the medial side is done, as you can see. And then slowly we release uh, the tissue here and take out the meniscus on the medial aspect, keeping the knee straight. Once we have taken out the medial meniscus, uh, we have enough freedom in the knee to subluxate it, uh, the patella more and more. As you can see, the medial part is now bare. And now with the patella, we can, yeah. So first we try to just subluxate, then we see how it is moving. And then so easy to uh, completely uh, open up the patella even without taking a single cut with the ACL intact, with everything still there. And being a retaining surgeon, I just cut the ACL and uh, I do not do any kind of other releases. So this is the exposure for you. It's quite simple and it can be done in about three to four minutes time. There's not much to do in really. And all the advantages, at least 80% of the advantages of sub approach apply to this approach also. So once we have done this, uh, the closure uh, is performed in some degrees of knee flexion, probably 30, 40 degrees. The suture placed at interval of the capsule at the top and starts. I do a running suture down and we close uh, the interval of capsule and muscular attachment. And proximally, sometimes it is not necessary, people say, to repair the muscle completely. But usually, for the sake of your own confidence, you may take two or three sutures and finish off your suture, which is running from down up. Once you've done this, you can do, a, you get better return of quadriceps muscle strength and much faster recovery. And after this, you can see it's, a, it's, it's an immediate, range of motion, 
you get full range of motion good flexion extension usually there are no clunks and a very good rotation also which of course these are all other issues which you get with all other approaches it doesn't matter what you are doing so once you've done this i think uh, that would be the end of my uh, talk and uh, it is a simple approach to do people who would do a subvastus approach would find it extremely easy while people would who would do uh, quadriceps uh, uh, medial parapatellar won't have any difficulty starting off with this approach has advantages of both and <clears throat> probably can be a good compromise thank you very much uh i think uh, we will discuss plus and minus and several things i think people would note down and we will have a pool talk at the end maybe at 5 10 minutes i would uh, quickly go on to uh, the lateral approach by manoj my dear friend from chandigarh and he has been uh, kind enough uh, in a busy day to join us today manoj i would hand it over to you uh, for yeah, lateral thanks. approach well while manoj is sharing the screen there are a couple of questions just if you can take a little discussion because dr yes. santanu hajra is asking that uh, can we do midvastus approach in flexion i usually yes. do it in that position yes we can actually we we should actually we can easily do it in flexion absolutely there is no issues and it was just uh, that uh, the video demonstration probably uh, is being done in extension but there is absolutely no contraindication at all it can be very easily done in flexion okay dr rakesh rajput is asking in difficult cases sometimes quad snip or reverse snip is done usually it is easier in a you know medial parapetal approach how is it done in sub or mid vastus or is there a different technique suppose if you want to you know it is difficult knee stiff knee or something like that uh, dr vikas well, followed by in a, in a very technique. yeah for a person like me who does all approaches including the lateral approach i would be taking as i said horses for courses so in a stiff knee where a jog of movement is there and fibrous ankylosis is there a uh, 5 degree to 10 degree range of motion is there i would not venture into any of these approaches i would straight away go to a medial parapetellar or a valgus as the situation might dictate or a lateral as the situation might dictate and do a quad snip or a, a extensile ex approach i am not a stickler to a particular approach neither am i so uh, great as dr shah would be able to probably give an answer to this question yeah what do you nilan me thank you uh, i think a stiff knee is defined variously by different people generally any knee which is having less than 90 degree is may be considered as stiff so i believe that the advantage of the subvastus approach is that you would release as much of the quadriceps muscle from the fascia as required and this will work akin a quadriceps snip secondly the thigh fascia the deep fascia of the thigh is also very very tight in these cases and you need to release the deep fascia of the thigh underneath your skin incision and if you remove the whole suprapatellar pouch plus you remove all the osteophytes your proximal mobilization of the quadriceps is sufficient if if you are dealing with a fused knee then sometimes i have done subvastus with a distal tibial tubercular osteotomy as well and that works quite well yes i think that is the trick uh, the distal part sometimes needs to be sorted out rather than a quadriceps knee i think well a point very important and valid point from dr shah okay we move ahead with the lecture thanks mohanty thanks uh, because for giving the opportunity now friends uh, unlike what my friends were speaking before talking of uh, different approaches which are very very versatile and you can use in different indications the moment we talk about lateral approach it has a very very specific indication that is a valgus knee so with the permission of the session moderator since i am going to speak on the correction of the valgus knee i'll sail you through a medial going on to the lateral approach and where is the absolute need of this approach in a valgus knee so friends these are my disclosures the moment we talk about a valgus knee correction so these are pictures like these where we have a valgus knee you have a plano valgoid foot 
so in these cases when you have these kind of a flexible deformities you have stretching of mcl going way on the frontal plane so this is your standard in cn the midline one you see externally rotated tibial tubercle now you see two markings on the left you see is what you have to use when you have to use a lateral approach and the other side is a medial parapetal now in a valgus knee as you always know we don't go very much to the posterior medial plane just to the mid coronal plane cut off the acl as dr manji said i am a cr user so only the acl goes off the entry portal is way medial because you have to prevent under correction so marking is on the intact side which is the medial side and you have a lateral defect this is what we all do for a correction of a valgus deformity we all know that in a valgus deformity you have a hypoplastic lateral side and a normal medial side so you have around 9 mm section on the medial side and 4 to 5 mm on the lateral side you don't align to the mid talus but you align to the center of the ankle joint now in this case when you see typically in a medial stretch you see a uh, elasticity on the medial side and the tight lateral side with, by which we do a pike resting of the it band now after this your extension knee is balanced in the flexion you take different rotation markers what you have to reach is a grand piano sign on the top all these things in a valgus knee correction we can achieve by our approach you maintain your flexion extension gap in extension first balance your knee come back in flexion you have a balanced flexion extension gaps and your knee is totally supple the only thing we released in this case was a uh, it band a pike resting and with this we have a totally aligned knee in flexion as well as extension the knee is totally balanced we have not done any under correction so in flexion and extension despite being a plantar valgoid i still use cr knees because i believe in all these valgus deformities where the pcl is already a medial stabilizing force now what is the downside of this medial approach a it is indirect we already have external rotation of the tibia and it increases the external rotation reaching at times to the posterior lateral corner is difficult in very stiff lateral knees with ffd you still require an extensive lateral release which has its own downsides of coverage as well as alignment your external rotation contracture of the tibia is not addressed and it may sort of encourage overleasing of deep soft tissues now that's where an indication where we move on that lateral approach is needed now as we see when you have enter in a car you can enter from either of the front door but it's always easier where the steering wheel is so in all those stiff valgoid knees or valgoid knees with flexion contractures is the case where you must be knowing how to do a lateral approach where you require and you see that you have a preoperative patellar mal tracking or patella lying totally into the lateral gutter dysplastic valgus deformity or a posterior lateral bone defects so that's where a lateral approach for correction of the valgus deformity is indicated so these are the things where you have a lot of stiffness going on you have remodeling into the distal femur or the proximal tibia you have posterior lateral defects so that's a direct approach you want to proper visualization of the lateral and the posterior lateral corners you want to go in for a titrated sequential release and to achieve a optimal tibiofemoral balancing and you can cover up all grades of your valgoid knees with this so there are four key steps the first key step is you have to achieve a coronal z plasty of the lateral retinaculum superiorly so that you can sublux the patella you at times go in for a quadriceps snip then you have a tight lateral structures which require a sequential titrated release and the fourth and the main step is you want a good soft tissue cover so your closure of lateral prosthetic joint is extremely important we'll go through the videos for each we all know this was designed by announced by dr kablish so the approach has remained the same with minor amount of modifications so talking of these approaches the recommended skin in cn in virginny follows the q angle so it is going on the lateral third of the tibial tubercle or of the patella going to the lateral border of the tendon and tibial tubercle so it is just off what you see as marked the medial in cn that we normally use on so you cut the skin the dermis and try to maintain flaps so you have to be very very careful to maintain a good blood and uh, vascular structures 
Now, this is the most important part of a quartal Z plasty. How do you do a lateral retinacular capsular complex maintain? So here, your superficial retinacular NCN is two to three centimeters of the lateral border of the patella is the one we see out here. That's where you dissect, but it does not go deep on like a medial approach. In a medial approach, we go spot on deep down to the bone here. We don't do that. We maintain the synovial tissues. We only sort of cut the lateral retinacular NCN, say two to three centimeters on the lateral border of the patella and undermine that. And out there, we develop a Z plus T where we maintain the interior and the posterior flap. The interior flap is this lateral retinacular tissue and the deep flap is this synovial tissue which is raised along the patellar border which we'll show. So this is a structure in a stiff knee that you see. You have got off the lateral retinacular structures and now you're going deeper. So two to three millimeter, two to three centimeters of the lateral retinacular is maintained. Once that is taken off, we go down to the deep synovial tissue, which is erased from the lateral border of the patella. So you have a Z plasty and two flaps intact with you. So the interior flap, which is this flap, which has this lateral retinacular tissue, is in continuity with the patella. The posterior flap, which is this deep tissue is in continuity with the patellar margin and that has a continuation of the IT band. Now the fat pad, once you reach distally out here, is cut 50%. So 50% fat pad goes with the intermeniscal ligament and 50% goes with the patellar tendon. So out here, so out here, we go across distally and there is the section of the retropatellar fat pad so 50% goes with the patellar sleeve and 50% goes with the lateral meniscal rim for increased soft tissue stability. So we have to plan these things very well because we want an optimal coverage of soft tissues. The distal extent of this retinacular incision ends at the gardeus tubercle and it continues distally into the interior compartment fascia. As you see out here, this is the lateral dissection. You raise the IT band from the Gertie's tubercle. Once you raise the IT band, you have already corrected the external rotation contracture. And from this, we go down into the interior compartment fascia. So the medial flap is made up, the lateral flap is made up. You have released from the patellar tendon down distally up to the tibial tubercle. Once this Z-plasty of the lateral ateclum is done, you have done a 50 section of the fat pad, you release the Gerdes tubercle IT band, and you have reached distally. You have these kind of resections. The one you see in the red is the superficial one. And once you see in the green is the deeper one. Now, this is very important for a endpoint closure that we'll show you subsequently. So this, this is the distal orthotomy. Now going on to the superior orthotomy, it is at times tougher to medially subluxate the patella and that's where you do a cordyceps snip. Just like you do an extensile snip from the medial approach, you do the same kind of 45 degree angle snip. The lateral edge of the Q tendon, cordyceps tendon was opened in an oblique fashion, as you see out here. So the lateral part of the cordyceps is released at 45 degrees. So you have formed a snip. Distally, you have an IT band released from the Gertie's tubercle. So now your lateral flap, which is this, contains the IT band, contains the retropatellar fat pad and the lateral meniscus. And your middle flap is this retinacular tissue going down with the patellar tendon and a snip on the top. So the osteoporosal release of this Gertie's tubercle IT band starts in extension and is completed in flexion. And this Combined release of IT band from the Gerdes tubercle mainly is going to correct majority of your external rotation contractures in a stiff knee. So this cordyceps snip done in most of the cases is going to give you a very good patellar eversion and joint exposure even for a very complex stiff knees. Then comes the story of tibial subluxation. Unlike a medial approach, a medial parapatellar approach in which we do an external rotation of the tibia, in this lateral approach, we do a internal rotation of the tibia. 
So once we do an internal rotation of the tibia, the pathological posterior lateral corner, which is always a trouble to reach in a medial parapetal approach, becomes easily visible, and you have an excellent visualization of the posterior lateral corner. And your external rotation deformity is already corrected. You take off the osteophytes, and then you go with the resection, just like we do normally. So as in the majority of the stiff knees that you see through, you have done a snip on the top. You have released the IT band from the Gertie's tubercle. You have subleted the patella on the lateral side. And now you can take out all suprapatellar adhesions and flex your knee. By doing the internal rotation maneuver, you are going to subluxate the tibia forward. In all those cases which are very, very stiff, you put a pin in the tibial tubercle so that you don't want an avulsion of the quadriceps tendon as you normally see. So with this, you have an exposure of your knee done across. So in couple of cases, you require a distal lateral collateral ligament release. So when you require these kind of releases, you just do a direct exposure and removal of the inner proximal fibula. Once you do that, the LCL automatically gets released and your tight lateral structures, the LCL, which gives you tightness in both flexion and extension is released. In couple of cases, you have a choice of doing a femoral sleeve release, but normally my personal choice is these sleeve releases of popliteus and LCL should be avoided because they give you instability. What you can still do is sliding condylateral osteotomy. In all those cases where you still have stiffness, you can't reach to the correction, don't do a periosteal sleeve, just do a lateral osteotomy. Once you do an osteotomy, your automatic lateral structures would take an alignment and then you can fix up your osteotomy with the screws. The femoral rotation markers go the same, whether do a medial or lateral approach, you align with your right sides line and apicondylar axis or the tibial cut, but never with the posterior condylar axis. So your extension gap is maintained, your fem uh, flexion gap is maintained. If you have tightness in flexion, you have a choice of doing a sliding lateral condylar osteotomy. So with this, you have a well-maintained flexion as well as extension gaps. Your snip is repaired the same way as you do it with the medial osteotomies. You do a closure across. With all these things, you have an excellent patellar tracking. Since you have a choice of doing a titrated lateral release, your correction of the patella is always going to be easier. Your medial structures, which are already stretched, are not going through any release. So they are already in space. You achieve a good stability. You achieve a good flexion extension gap balancing. Repair your snip. And now comes the question, how do we cover this flap tissues? So on the top area, we have covered the snip. In the distal areas, we have this tissue, which is the retinacular tissue. And this tissue which was the deeper synovial tissue. And out here is the fat pad, which were resected and closed. So this is the area that we have now covered up because if you don't cover up these areas, in a lateral approach, the biggest problem is how do you cover up these implants? So like in this case also, if you see this, this is the retinacular synovial tissue with the fat pad, your knee is well balanced in flexion and extension, and this is the soft tissue cover you have achieved in these kind of even stiff, well guard contracted knees. So the advantage to summarize of the lateral approach, number one, for all those very stiff knees with the patellar mild tracking, it is a direct approach. It accomplishes the direct extensive lateral release that you would have done in a medial approach. So in all those cases where the lateral structure is extremely tight, you just go on to do an extensive lateral release, so which is not required separately in these cases. So there is less chances of skin undermining. It internotates the tibia and uh, improves the closure. Above all, your external rotation contracture is well balanced in a lateral approach, which still is many times persistent if you correct a well guard knee with a medial approach. So it allows your plant soft tissue gap and prosthetic coverage, centralizes the cordyceps patellar tendon mechanism. Rehab is unimpeded because your medial cordyceps is always intact and it improves your femoral alignment stability. And uh, I thank you so much. Hope I'm able to clear on this uh, complex lateral approach part. Thank you, Manoj. You can uh, stop sharing your screen. Uh, the most important uh, point elucidated uh, by you, Manoj, was the coverage, the Kiblish uh, uh, technique where two layers are separated and uh, which is a uh, foresight to the closure uh, difficulties which we have and separation of the patellar fat pad and using it to cover the implant. So these are two extremely important uh, 
it's like getting into a chakra view and trying to come out of it is uh, that is what you do in a lateral approach most of the times and that is a very important take home uh, dr monty i would like to proceed with your permission because it's uh, uh, yeah yeah you can go ahead is there any question, the question in the chat later. works sir? okay uh, by the time you know uh, who so is the doc- next speaker dr asit would be talking on uh, the tri vector approach which is not used commonly and it would be great to hear him dr asit uh, you can uh, yeah. start with sure by the time he is sharing the screen uh, there is a question from dr nilan sath is resurfacing of patella more difficult through lateral approach not really because you are directly on over there you can always uh, subdux this patella and uh, do it do we need to reciprocating saw for or uh... no no similar you have those patella cutting jigs which cut at 90 degrees angle it if you has it so with those jigs it's very very easy to do the sections okay thank you yeah over to ashit please right good evening friends thank you subranshu and thank you vikas for this opportunity so we have heard excellent talks about how do we approach a knee for a total replacement i'm going to speak little bit different it's a trivector arthrotomy which i do for most of my all my cases primary tkrs one of the commonest issues that we see during tkr is mal tracking of the patella keeping in mind that component design surgical techniques quadriceps imbalance and trauma are the main cause as most of the experienced surgeons component design surgical techniques are fairly standardized now so it remains that you have to balance the quadriceps very properly i mean that's what that's what came out from all the talks uh, you know before me that doing a total knee we have to approach the knee from front and obviously that means either altering the quadriceps mechanism and here we have to make sure that quadriceps is disturbed minimally the common issues are lateral subluxation of the patella anterior knee pain frank dislocations patella component wear so what happens in trivector arthrotomy is it effectively retains the balance of the quadriceps muscle without limiting the exposure we know that uh, subvastus and midvastus approach are very good however most of the surgeons most of the surgeons find it difficult because of the lack of uh, complete exposure so this particular uh, approach was designed by kenneth bramlett from birmingham alabama usa and this is what exactly happens is we've seen subvastus going this way and medial parapatellar either border cut 25 or 50 percent time what happens in a trivector arthrotomy is this is the line that goes up to this and that is the subvastus approach as you can see here this is the subvastus exposure of the knee now how does the name come from it's basically as we see the red arrows in the picture on your right are the three main uh, vectors that control the quadriceps mechanism in the quadriceps it means fourth and the fourth vector is in this direction so it's the lat- vastus lateralis the intermedius with rectus and the vastus medialis obliquus these three are the dynamic uh, forces and that is stabilized by this patellar tendon going up to the tibial tuberosity so if you see normal knee it's the end result of all this vector is medially pulling patella and that's how patella remains in the trochlear notch so if we do anything on the medial side which will destabilize these vectors there are increased chances of dislocation or subluxation of the patella very important slide which compares the various uh, uh, approaches as compared to tri vector and it's near proximity to the normal quadriceps strength normal quadriceps is 4300 tri vector it remains 3700 as you go down into the middle parapatella arthrotomy this reduces similarly the shear is in the normal quadriceps it's 8 and tri vector is 160 and as you go lower down it increases this so basically the deviation of total quadriceps resultant force is minimal in tri vector as compared to rest of the arthrotomy incision and this is the study from biomechanical journal so how does this happen it happens that you th- this is the patella tendon and this is the sorry this is a quadriceps tendon it's a head end this is a vastus medialis obliquus we leave one finger breadth and take a directly vertical incision the lower half of the incision is exactly same as what we do for the most of the 
at the subvastus or medial parapatella arthrotum. It's only the proximal half of the incision that changes. As we see here, this is the patella, this is the foot end, and this particular incision arthrotomy goes into the vastus medialis obliquus, just lower one inch of the vastus medialis obliquus is where it is uh, in size with sharp dissection, and the lower part of the incision is exactly same as we do for any other arthrotomy incisions. As we see here, again, exactly it is the same that we do a sharp dissection. I normally use a knife to do the, to lift from the medial periosteum of the tibia. The entry is through the anterior horn of the medial meniscus, and that is how the entire joint is exposed. Whether it is a, and then once the joint is exposed, we do a standard total knee replacement, and then we'll look at the closure. So whether it's a varus knee, whether it's a valgus knee, post HTO or obese, we have a very good exposure of the entire knee with the dislocation or with the complete eversion of the patella, which makes the entire distal femur and proximal tibia deliver into the wound. After the implantation, as you see here, the tracking of the patella is also brilliant. And once we close it, it will be very good. So this is a closure in the proximal part of the wound. As you know, the quadriceps in proximal part has got two layers. One is the deep layer of the tendon, and there is a superficial layer of the muscles. As we see here, that repair has to be perfect with interrupted sutures through the muscle going to the tendon, coming out of the tendon, and coming out of the muscle here, and then taking an inverted knot. So same way with interrupted sutures of bicryl, we do the proximal repair, and similarly, a distal repair. Here, we see a surgical video. This is a little old, so this is done with the tourniquet. And this is more recent one, <coughs> which is done without tourniquet. As you see on the picture on your left, which is where I'm showing right now, this is what exactly happens. This is the foot end. We leave a centimeter of cuff tissue medial to the patella and curve the knife gently to go into the vastus medialis obliquus, leaving some amount of muscle tissue with the tendon on the tendon side and remaining on the medial side. The lower part of the arthrotomy of lifting of the subperiosteal tissue is same. Extend the knee and very easily you can evert the patella and then flex the knee very gently. So this way your entire knee is exposed, the distal femur, the patella is everted out of the way and the tibia is also there. You go ahead with the implantation of your implant, carry out with the procedure and this is how you see the tracking. It is brilliant. Brilliant tracking. If you see the repair now, when it comes to repair, is it's interrupted sutures taken through the muscle, through the tendon on this side, and then the white tendon here, which you can see, I'm taking underneath that and closing the wound there. <clears throat> if you see, this is without tourniquet again, now with the modern technique of hypotensive anesthesia, this is how the incision is seen going into the muscle here and not into the tendon. If you see here, this is the deeper part of the tendon, the white structure that you see, and this is the muscular belly. And similarly, on the other side, that is the part of the tendon and the muscular belly. So the repair of the soft tissue proximally has to be perfect. It has to go through the muscle and the tendon, and from the other side, tendon and to the muscle. So this is how exactly the closure is done. It's a watertight closure. And as you can see, patient's got good flexion and has got excellent uh, range of movement. If you see now the video on the right, that is also similar exposure that we do. We take the, uh, with a sharp dissection, we remove the soft tissues in the front and go all the way up to the where the femur touches the tibia. And that is how the knee, entire knee is exposed. The tibia, the patella is still in its position, but we extend the knee at this stage. Patella is very easily everted and then flex the knee. So now the entire distal femur is, is exposed to you. I normally do a PS knee, so I remove the anterior and post, uh, anterior cruciate, whatever remnants, and uh, posterior cruciate, and then go ahead with implantation of the total knee. <clears throat>
and the closure is exactly same as I have depicted in this video. That is again going through the muscle and tendon and again tendon to muscle just with a single layer of one stitch and the entire knee is closed. We go ahead proximally repair the same way. Again, the tendon and the muscular belly. So these are the results. This is a lady who had this surgery about two, three days ago, walking without any walker or any stick. This lady again walking without second or third day. Same approach. No extension leg, 48, air, 48 hours post-op, good flexion range of movement. And that's the most important thing in this approach. There is no extension lag. And as you saw, there is an excellent exposure, just similar to what you get in medial parapetella arthrotomy. Another gentleman, third day post-op, doing regular reciprocating uh, stair climbing without much difficulty and without much pain on his face. This is the lady, this is on the fourth day, uh, sorry, third, third day after the surgery, walking well. Don't need walker or walking stick, and they are comfortably walking. 87 year old gentleman walking very well, no problems, no walker, no stick needed. This lady, same approach, had a bilateral knee. So, this is a bilateral total knee, third day walking comfortably. And if you see now, she has a normal sort of a gait. She's able to bend the knee. She's able to completely extend the knee and have a heel strike. Most of our total knee patients, they find it difficult to walk with this kind of gait pattern in initial few days. So now if we compare medial parapatella with trivector arthrotomy, no doubt medial parapatella is an excellent exposure. Patella can be dislocated and it is extensile. All these advantages are there in trivector arthrotomy. However, the split in the quadriceps tendon in medial parapatellar alters the dynamic balance of the force on the patella, which does not happen in trivector arthrotomy. Now, comparing with subvastus, obviously in subvastus, the quad stabilization force is maintained, which is minimally altered in trivector arthrotomy. However, I personally feel that this is subvastus is non extensile, it is limited surgical exposure. There can be soft tissue damage due to retraction of the soft tissues. And it has got long and steep learning curve, which I'm sure Nilan has come over very quickly. But most of the average surgeons, you know, find it very difficult in terms of a, a, a wide exposure. So in trivector, obviously, we have an adequate exposure. It can be very easily performed. And it is an extension of medial parapetellar arthrotomy without the disadvantage of medial parapetellar arthrotomy. And it has got limited soft tissue damage and got short learning curve. And hence, it is reproducible by most of the surgeons. When you split the quadriceps tendon, the normal force of the vastus lateralis, which pulls the patella more on the lateral side, is not balanced from the medial side. It's like tug of war, as kids we used to play, the stronger side would pull on that side. So if there is medial weakness because of any of this uh, alteration with this uh, medial parapatellar tendon, the chances of patella subluxing on the lateral side are higher. So let's see the literature. A couple of slides, a medial trivector approach in total knee, Fisher et al. He compared bilateral TKRs, one side medial parapetal, one side trivector. And trivector group had independent SLR two days earlier, and the muscle strength, even at six months, was 15% higher in trivector group. Bramlett, who designed this particular uh, approach, said that incidence of lateral retinacular, uh, lateral retinacular release is minimized. Comparing to medial parapetellar group, which had average four to five degrees of extension lag at the time of discharge, trivector group had no extension lag at that time. A fully extended knee with the knee in stance phase, better gait pattern, and it is energy efficient for patients to uh, ambulate after the surgery. Another uh, article from UK in uh, also compared surgical approach of total knee, medial parapetellar versus trivector, and their conclusion was in trivector group, ability to perform SLR, absence of extension lag, and knee flexion range of movement is better as compared to 
medial para parapatella group. Here we can see first three patients are still in the hospital and are able to do this. Obviously, it depends on the surgical technique and the implants used. However, the anterior quadriceps is balanced so beautifully well with this particular approach that they can get this particular kind of range of movement. This lady with the bilateral knee is also able to sit this. And this is what most of our Indian patients like to do. And that's a question they ask in our consulting. So in summary, it gives us an adequate exposure. It can be used for any deformity, be it varus, valgus, obese patients with short thighs, post hto TKRs, revision, stiff knees as well. It, uh, lateral release uh, need is minimized. It retains the strength of the vastus medialis obliquus and has got minimal complications. So it has an excellent result that supports the continued use of this approach. It is a true mechanical approach and hence gateway for all knees for at least me. And I've been using it since 2005 and there are no particular major complications uh, with this particular uh, uh, approach. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Great. So we have uh, excellent uh, long-term users of each approach, which is a great, and it's an honor to have faculties of this level in our group and society. Thank you, Ashit Bhai. It's a privilege to have you over. Thank you for okay. such a long and nice uh, talk on trivector, which is not done usually by many people. I would uh, now request you to stop sharing stop. your screen Can and I would uh, quickly invite uh, my friend Rajkumar uh, for uh, the next uh, show which is on tibial tuberculosis journey. We are uh, out slowly out of time but I think these are two very important lectures left uh -huh. which we need to cover up. Because I need two, three minutes to about IO concert. Can we talk now or? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Just, just I am me. sorry. I am yeah. sorry. I, I think we need to. Two, uh, three minutes, uh, Ashit. Uh, Dr. Yes. Ashit is going to yes, yes. No problem. I'll be quick. Yeah. And uh, so, now it gives me great pleasure to invite all my friends, faculty, arthroplasty surgeons, orthopedic surgeons from all over our country to... I invite you all to Bombay for our IAACON. IAACON, as Dr. Mohanty just mentioned, the starting of our talk is happening on 22nd to 24th of October in Mumbai at Renaissance uh, Convention Center. The two important things for this conference is, first of all, it's a silver jubilee year for IAA. The conferences for IAA started happening since 1995 and 2020 was the 25th year. However, last year, could not happen because of the pandemic and hence we've taken up this challenge this time to hold it in Mumbai and it will be considered as your Jubilee conference and it is happening in physical format so it's a chance for all of us to meet after a long time of two years because 2020 none of the major joint replacement conferences happened and 21 also this is the first physical meet that is happening so we as an organizing team uh, under the guidance of Dr. Uh, Mohanty, who is the president of IAA, locally, Dr. Harish Bende, myself, Dr. Muta are trying very hard, uh, along with Dr. Samir Agrawal's input, that, you know, we put up a big and nice show. We have our organizing committee, our advisors, and our scientific committee. Now, any conference, the main important thing, the strength of any conference is the scientific uh, program. And we have put up a very robust scientific program, 20 hours of academics in two and a half days. Now, this will include good live surgeries, which we try, which we'll get from uh, faculty abroad who will be doing it in camera surgery, in box surgery, live in box surgery with faculty being available. And we are going to put very different topics this time, like cementless knee or patellofemoral arthroplasty, robot assisted total hip arthroplasty. So, at least four of this uh, surgical demonstration that you can see and lies with the faculty. We will have good, we have more or less come out of the didactic lectures and we'll be having good five hip and five knee sessions. We'll try to cover most of the topics that are there and some general topics like DVD prophylaxis, infection control, etc. So overall, we've tried to put up a very nice and robust program for young surgeons who want to join. We have free paper session and there will be e-poster uh, stations also available. So I would request you all to submit your abstracts and if selected as the best free paper which will be 
uh, given a talk during that uh, conference, will be awarded an IAA fellowship with one of the faculty members. So that is something really a good uh, return gift from the IAA to the junior surgeons. So overall, we have put up a very strong show and it is happening at Renaissance in Mumbai, which few of you might have visited, but it is an excellent place, excellent venue where we can have this conference. And do not worry, Dr. Mohanty, Dr. Mutha are very experienced in holding a conference just six months ago, just before the second wave of pandemic. So they've taken all the measures that we need to take for your safety, for our safety, delegate safety, and uh, the uh, government measures that are going to come. So I would request all of you to please go through this and register as soon as possible. First window of, was till 15th of September, but now second one is till 30th of September. So please, you can register online also. Visit uh, Arthro, Indian Arthroplasty Association website. Dr. Raj Kumar has done a lot of hard work in getting the page uh, running and active so you can register online. And uh, so we all wait to meet and greet you here in Mumbai on 22nd till 24th of October. Thank you very much, Subhanshu, and thank you, Vikas, for uh, giving me this time. Thank you. I am sorry, Ashit. We, I just missed out on my uh, this thing. Uh, so uh, with you uh, halting your screen share, uh, ah. I would like to again re-invite and reinforce your invitation for everybody, all our friends, to IAA Con uh, uh, 2021. And uh, now I would like uh, Dr. Rajkumar to start his uh, talk on tibial tuberculosis osteotomy. Rajkumar, over to you. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Vikas, for your kind invitation and uh, thanks for inviting me for this uh, program. I would like to thank Dr. Mohanty, the president of IA also, for this putting up a, once again a wonderful webinar. Without wasting time, I would like to go to the topic tibial tuberculosis osteotomy. Unlike the other topics, uh, which was more of approach based, this is a topic where it is more of a procedure based, even though it is for uh, approach to the joint, the, pro the whole procedure is, uh, it's a small procedure where which is uh, <clears throat> gaining a lot of uh, popularity now. So, to put it very simple, what is the indication for tibial tuberculosis osteotomy? So, the tibial tuberculosis osteotomy, nowadays, a uh, lot of surgeons are uh, performing this because of the enough knowledge available about this uh, osteotomy, once which was really uh, found that we are really it was very uh, cautious. So surgeons were very cautious in performing this, but nowadays the indications are very, very clear and the knowledge is available very much. So what are the indications here? So the need for an adequate joint visualization when standard approaches are not sufficient. That is the first indication. Inability to dislocate the patella in a stiff knee. You will feel that when you flex the knee, it is very difficult to ever uh, lateralize the petala or uh, invert, invert the petala. So when you once you start doing that, the petala tendon starts peeling off. So that is the situation where you will not like to go ahead rather, rather than do something else, either a quadriceps limp or a tibial tuberculosis osteotomy. Basically, need to access the tibial canal. That is in revision scenarios. So it is very, very important. In some situations, the petala baga has to be corrected. But overall, to put it in a nutshell, it is basically the uh, without any uh, difficulty to access the joint, to visualize the joint. That is the whole idea without damaging the petalar tendon, either peeling or rupture. These are the two. Avulsion, anything can happen. So to avoid that, we need an approach. So for that, tibial tubal osteotomy helps. So it is very, very important. So the most common situation is either a complex primary or a revision scenario. So in complex primary, an example like this, it is the stiff knee. It was so a lot of uh, talk, a uh, lot of uh, points were given by the uh, uh, previous faculty about the stiff knee, how to approach with various approach, various uh, approaches. But in this tibial tubal class geotomy, the approach is medial parapetalar, but the procedure itself helps us. So particularly in stiff knee in a rheumatoid situation or a post-traumatic arthritis, where these kind of hardwares are there, once you remove that, look at the x-ray. So patient is very osteoporotic, multiple screw holes. The petala has become so thin, osteoporotic. In this situation, you try to flex. 
the knee, then the tibial tube, uh, patellar tendon gets ruptured, so damaged. So that is the situation where you would like to avoid that. So to prevent the patellar tendon peeling off in these kind of stiff knee situation, in revision total knee replacement, obviously multiple surgeries has been done. So in this situation, an example where the uh, uh, peg of the all poly uh, component is broken inside. So here you have to remove that. So you need a wide exposure for that. Definitely a patellar tendon or uh, sorry, tibial tubercle osteotomy helps. So basically in these kind of revision scenarios for a wide exposure to remove the implants, to do all the uh, cleaning, to do the cuts again, to do perform the entire procedure for a wide exposure, this um, approach helps the tibial tubercle osteotomy. Once again, one more example here, a stiff knee, no movement at all. This patient came in a stretcher, no flexion. The knee was almost straight. So in these kind of situation, the stable tubal cord osteotomy is an excellent uh, procedure to have as an armamentarium. So look at this uh, patient again, an example of a 60-year-old male where an aseptic loosening, uh, flexion deformity is there, range of motion. Even though the range of motion is good here, because of these kind of uh, implants inside, you, you can perform a tibial tubal costatomy. It can be performed without that also, but the chances of uh, patellar tendon damage is so much. So in these kind of situations, it helps us. So to start with, if you look at this video here, so as a uh, basic, like a, a Dr. Mohanty very, very nicely explained about the medial parapetlar arthrotomy. Once you do that, you put a home and here, make sure you're uh, erasing the soft tissue from the medial uh, tibial condyle completely without any uh, damage to the patellar tendon, this side, or to the la mid lateral side. So you be uh, underneath the soft tissue as you do routinely for any other uh, total knee replacement. Make sure you are not raising multiple flaps so that the healing becomes good. So do that erase. So after you do that, then you will know that, that uh, you can assess perioperatively how much of difficulty is there to lateralize the petala. So even that time you can take a decision whether to go ahead with the procedure or to do a tibial tubercle osteotomy. So this is the, the next video showing that once you have done that, you can take a uh, diathermy and mark exactly where you are going to perform the tibial tubercle osteotomy, that is the TTO. So here I'm removing the uh, soft tissue and also the infra petala uh, fat pad little bit. You need not remove it entirely, but you have to visualize the area. You have to demark it between the tendon and the soft tissue so that you make a clear mark with this uh, cartry and then so you will know exactly where you are going to do that so this is how so the next par uh, part is the measurement of the tibial tubal costatomy so here we have to be very very careful about the thickness and the length so what is the length definitely it should be somewhere between six to eight centimeters on an average so you that what is that what is the tip for that your entire patellar tendon has to be included you cannot stop midway it's very obvious that you should not damage the patellar tendon so the length of the petal, uh, the osteotomy should be six to eight centimeters, starting from the uh, uh, starting from that uh, uh, tibial condyle base. So from there, the apex should be curved. The tip of the uh, distal portion should be curved. It should not be a sharp, straight osteotomy. It should be curved. Why? It will, if it is very uh, straight, then it becomes a stress riser. So fracture can happen. So it has to be a curve and include the whole tendon. So remember that the length should be 6 to 8 centimeters. The next is the thickness. It should be 1 to 1.5 centimeters, preferably around 1. Maybe if the patient is bulky, you can have it as 1.5 centimeter based on the amount of bone available. So that is the most important thing. So here you have to make sure that this amount of thickness is there because the more thin, then the chances of breakage of the osteoarthritis. That is the most common complication which happened the uh, breakage. So once it breaks, then it becomes very difficult to reattach. The apex of the osteotomy should be at the level of the tibial tubercle. These are the three most important things, the length, the thickness, and the apex, and the tip has to be curved. So here, what I do is I make two uh, holes into the osteotomy before, before making the osteotomy as such, because I know now the tibial uh, the measurement is done, the thickness is done, and I have made a mark in the with the diathermic cartery. So with all these things, make a two or three drill holes, depending upon the length, whether it is six or eight centimeters, based on that, make a two drill holes for refixation. And then what I do is, I don't, I take a saw and I don't cut off the entire osteotomy through the saw. This is only to make a 
small entry point so like it's like almost one fourth or the three uh, midway till the of the osteotomy direct it little posterior and towards laterally starting from the anterior tibial cortex medial to lateral so little posterior lateral but not don't take it through and through why two important points not to take it through and through with the saw what is that if you if you take it through and through the heat generated devas chances of devascularization of that whole osteotomy bone is more so don't take it through and through so what i do take after making a um, entry with the saw through and through that 6 to 8 cm then i make take three osteotomes or two depending upon the size again and make it like uh, uh, like you do a tibial tuber like eto you keep uh, making enter, enter the osteotomy after the cut from the uh, saw place it from the top to bottom that is proximal to distal evenly so once you done that so you have to together together of all the three osteotomes or the two osteotomes you have to use the mallet gently tap inside and then lift it so it's almost like breaking the lateral cortex not by the saw but by the osteotome because of the thickness already marked the entry made with the blade this makes this is made easier with the osteotome so that is the one by not making the cut through and through with a blade so the next this is how the osteotomy so once it is reflected the next is the most important thing the second point which i want to make is the lateral soft tissue sleeve should be intact that is the most important thing. if you take a saw and do it through and through it becomes very difficult the, the soft tissue also is gets damaged and the heat is generate so much so here the second point is your sleeve lateral soft tissue sleeve is very important because of one is the uh, vascularity and the second thing is the uh, osteotomy uh, bone will not migrate proximally so the sleeve will make it intact it will keep the whole osteotomy in place this is the most important thing once this is done almost your procedure is entirely done so once this is done you can uh, uh, lateralize the patella and then the joint is there for you whether it is a stiff knee or a complex knee now you can flex the knee do the entire procedure without any difficulty and then the last portion is the re uh, fixation so how i re refix this i learned from the ridian uh, dr ridian morgan jones who is who advocated this uh, suturing technique after uh, this i learned in 2013 when he visited our center from that time i have never used any other material always the uh, suture material for refixation this is how it is fixed so once you uh, already a hole is made uh, with the 2 mm drill bit 2 mm uh, thick of hole is made in the osteotomy bone and then the other the at, for attaching it you have to make holes corresponding to that same level into the medial cortex of the tibia that is the proximal tibial condyle in the medial cortex you make another two holes in the same level in the from the uh, osteotomy bone then reattach through that just the while reattaching the knee should be in extension in extension reattach with this phi ethi bond no need of any other suture materials or a screws i never use screws or any ss wire with this the it goes and sits nicely you can we realign it properly with your hand no need of any towel clip very very unlikely to you uh, rarely you need that just keep it it will all fall in place because of the so lateral soft tissue sleeve and also the knee in extension so there is no tension in the whole osteotomy uh, bone or the patella tendon so resuture it properly nicely with the uh, phi zero ethi point and this is how after suturing it immediately you can flex the knee no need no hesitation no need to immobilize it no need to keep it uh, in a uh, in a brace or in, if you want you can keep it in a brace but the patient can start bending it the next day itself active mobilization can be done like any other procedure the ethi bond uh, uh, really secures it because of the soft tissue lateral soft tissue sleeve and the correct tension and the placement and the thickness of the bone the whole patella tendon falls in place and there is no issue this is how it is sutured back without any issue and uh, the the suture material here i use is only for that um, refixation of the osteotomy part i use this 50 ethi bond the rest of the medial parapetalar uh, Uh, uh opening the arthrotomy site is closed with the regular y grill whichever we use regularly the osteotomy site is closed with 50 ethi bond non absorbable stitch so this is uh, this is a patient underwent uh, for a 
stiff knee rheumatoid look at after one year without any difficulty and see the lateral view where the osteotomy is healed without any migration so the whole point here is the refixation no issue with the metal or screws or breakage of the osteotomy because you are using only the ethi point this is one year post op just three literature again uh, published by in journal of arthroplasty by ridian morgan jones that this technique gives a satisfactory to very good outcome avoiding the hardware related problems one more mid term results of this uh, tto is a valid and safe option in pro proximal and co sorry complex primary and revision totally it is a reliable option with low complication rate just we have to follow these small small tips very important lastly recently published 2019 it is a very good approach considering the increase in post operative rom so this procedure can also expose a wide range of surgical sites without obstructing the circulation of the surrounding soft tissue so we can definitely uh, form this osteotomy we can practice that it's very very easy to perform so con to conclude tibial tubercle osteotomy allows excellent access to the joint don't hesitate to do use it in a stiff knee also due to a post traumatic or a rheumatoid arthritis situation if needed otherwise in revision total knees definitely it is also ad advisable suture fixation with 50 ethi bond can be recommended as it prevents the complications of metal fixations thank you oh so uh, thank you rajkumar as uh, expected you did a wonderful job of a uh, very difficult topic very uh, well explained and especially the last one can dr. i ask Subhan. a question yeah yes, yes dr. dr monty dr monty please go ahead yeah uh, rajkumar you you don't uh, need to put a stem extender when you do a tibial osteotomy no need you never put a stem never extender. i have never done a stem extension that in complex primaries no need at all if the indication is for any other reason not for the osteotomy okay and number 2 is it's not 50 ethi one it's number 5 ethi one 50 will be too thin yeah number 2 and number 5 ethi one. okay uh, okay sorry maybe uh, yeah. but but if you if it's it uh, the five ethi bond comes you open it you will have two needles with five numbers inside so it's a non absorbable it's yeah, very yeah. very strong yeah, yeah. i think uh, one one small uh, addition to what dr monty was asking uh, i think the valid uh, problem is that if you have an osteotomy which is slightly deeper won't you have a exposed uh, tibial keel even i think that is what yeah 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 dr uh, uh, vikas that's a very good question even if the keel is exposed little bit sometimes if the osteotomy is thicker need not worry at all the periphery everything heals off very quickly your apex is also the distal portion also sits very nicely over the tibial tubercle just beneath that there is a good bone available so no need to worry in revisions definitely already the bone is thin after the removal of the implants so only thing is make sure in that keel area not much of cement is there before attaching the osteotomy bone that cement alone has to be chipped off little bit there. otherwise no issues at all the big advantage here is the there is no risk for breakage of the osteotomy bone with all the screws and uh, ss wires and for a knee fixed in extension would you have uh, immediate post operative range of motion of 90 yes yes next have... day all these patients next day they are made to do active knee bending initially i was also scared to do that but after seeing in person after i started doing that i i see that patients are so comfortable it's he it think, feels yeah, well. ashit, ashit, dr ashit has a point, question we'll move on after that yeah yes uh, rajkumar so yes. when you do this for stiff knees hmm. okay and those patients are stuck in extension say 10 15 degrees and now you start flexing you know after your surgery is complete hmm. generally the osteotomy migrates proximally yes if your soft lateral soft tissues are intact as you opened up the osteotomy on the lateral hinge how would it allow that osteotomy to migrate proximally number 1 and if not that patient would not be restricted in getting the flexion extension after see, surgery now, see i'll tell you one thing in stiff knees as you said, said there might be a chance of small uh, migration proximally and there are enough literature which says even if it migrates a little bit it doesn't make a big difference because the patient gets full all over him if there is a small gap if there is a small gap after resuturing or once you flex it 
only thing is you already there are a lot of bone available you have to just pack it in that small gap wherever the osteotomy has been performed and uh, there is a very good literature which uh, which recently published about this small migration doesn't make any big difference at all so when you when it migrates proximally those hmm. two holes that you made to take that hc bond sutures no. it will be mal aligned no 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 so the whole holes i make only in the uh, uh, osteotomy bone alone in the tibial okay. tibial side i make it once i align it manually okay. so okay. i don't take it through and through before the osteotomy okay. Okay. so i don't need to worry about that there and are the, there are going to be lot of issues and discussions with you rajkumar i think we will take it some time now yeah uh, dr rajiv sharma uh, is waiting for the final assault uh, on uh, very difficult knees and and uh, i'm sure he would uh, be raring to go uh, dr rajiv sharma it's all yours thank you vikas thank you friends uh, thank you shubhranshu ashit uh, it's a wonderful webinar uh, having the very difficult uh, situations very simple situations and well explained uh, i'll try to explain uh, some difficult exposures as the topic has been given uh, i'll explain it with the help of the three of my cases the requirement of the of the extensive exposure in in, in all stiff knees where you have the fractures around the knee arthritic or intraarticular deformities malunion metaphyseal or diaphyseal where you have the extra articular deformities where you have the non unions and where you have the implant fixation previous implant fixations in revision situations ligamentous injuries retained implants are the big issue to be dealt with previous whether the retained implant is a plate or a screws uh, or it is the previous uh, previously done total knee arthroplasty uh, previous surgical scars because if there is a previous surgical scar you like to make sure that uh, uh, you respect that uh, occult infection remains a big big issue in these difficult cases stiffness ankylosis uh, is the major thing to be dealt with soft tissue contractures and above all the osteoporotic bones because that makes it very difficult supposedly you are wanting to do a tibial tubercle osteotomy in a very osteoporotic bone i think it's a, it's a little little challenging job maltreated fractures which lead to stiff stiff knees contracted periarticular tissues adhesions in the medial lateral gutters soft tissue release alone may not be sufficient to expose the joint and there is always the risk of avulsion of the patellar tendon so these are the situations where you need to have something something special Uh, uh in the surgical method uh, exposure in these cases can lead to the skin necrosis because of the previous multiple surgeries extensor mechanism problems for example the patellar tendon ruptures component malpositioning because of the limited exposure if you if you don't have extensive exposure and of course paraoperative fracture which remains a major issue so first case we we discuss here the patient who is having the severe valgus deformity and and a, and a unstable knee and that's what we see here um, you see that the left knee we are talking about at the moment the bones are very severely osteoporotic so this is not a good case for the uh, for the tibial tubercle osteotomy uh, there is a previous surgical scar and with that you see that how this patient is is able to walk with very difficulty and the, and the valgus uh, remains significant and that also causes the medial laxity uh, the medial stretching of the, the of the middle collateral ligament and not just this but the knee is going into the hyperextension so all these things have to be seen very carefully that's what this patient now we take up the previously done uh, previous surgical scar this patient had a stiff knee around 80 degrees was the flexion first you release the proximally in the, under the quadriceps all the adhesions to be removed and the scissors i find is a, is a very very easy and uh, simple method then it then it tibial tubercle the, the ligament of patellar peel the, the 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 banana peel that's what what it is called it has to be done with a very very sharp dissection you change at least 3 to 4 blades in one one exposure and you keep keep exposing it up keep uh, working on the on the periosteal uh, line and then you see that this this joint becomes easily exposed 
It is not the surgery which is done very frequently, but this is a very useful and easy tool in, in your armamentarium. Uh, it should be done very carefully. You are not over-releasing it. You are not trying to uh, break the soft tissue envelope. So this envelope should remain intact. And if that is so, then you can see that this uh, knee is very easily exposed while, while it was looking quite difficult in exposure. And suiting it, it back is, is again very easy like the like Dr. Rajkumar showed very well the tibial tubercle osteotomy fixation. Similarly, you can do the fixation of the, of the this peeled tissues. And, and when you do this, you expect that these patients who have been out having the difficult problems, they will not be able to do the full extension in, in first month or two months. They will take at least three to four months time. Especially these cases where you have, where you see that the left side implant is uh, very, uh, very loose, the hemiprocesses, the right hip is severely arthritic. So you expect that these patients may not be able to walk very well until, unless you perform more surgeries. But the exposure is, is very important in these patients. How these peeled tissues can be sutured back is very simple. You just make the multiple drill holes, use the number five hip bond and suture it back. And it, it, and it works very well. Of course, the, the quadriceps uh, will take time uh, to gain the full strength. These are other difficult situation where you have the laterally fixed plate, fracture non-union, uh, difficult situation where the patient is, is, has been walking like this for many, many years actually. And then she comes for the surgery. Now these patients also, because you have the lateral scar, you have the lateral scar for the plating also. So here, what kind of a scar this, uh, this surgical approach you should take? You should take the anterolateral approach, which was already used for this patient earlier. And, and what implant you can use? You can use a tumor processes in this kind of a situation because you have a significant scarring of the posterior tissues. And that's what you see here. The uh, tumor processes uh, being, being fixed in, the joint exposed from the lateral approach in a very easy way. As the, my colleagues have shown, the lateral approach is, is not as difficult as uh, uh, one may imagine. Uh, and of course, the lateral approach, when you take, you must be careful that, yes, this approach is going to have more bleeding than in the normal side. You see that this kind of a patient can be given a brace, and then the full range of function can be, can be achieved, like, like what we see here. And full weight bearing is, is allowed almost immediately. This must be about a five or six days post-operative situation. The another ankylose knee, there what kind of approach you must take? You can take in this kind of a situation, uh, tibial tubercle osteotomy, careful dissection, appropriate size and season. And you see that when you have a, a scar laterally, uh, medially, so you will not like to go medially in this. So again, in this kind of a situation, you are forced to take a anterolateral approach. That's what you see. And between the, the uh, patella, the, which is fused, uh, you can use the multiple osteotomes and you can just keep raising it up. And you, you will see that it is not very difficult to find the posterior cruciate ligament in this situation, like what you see here. The, in, in, the infused knees also, it is very easy to those who are using the CR knees can use probably the CR knee in these situations. Now, these are the very stable situation. They are not usually causing the much of the instability like what you see here. And we could do in this patient, uh, a mobile bearing joint. You see that this, this was the extensive surgery, so you had a lot of ichymosis. And you see this patient is able to negotiate stairs very easily. In this picture, if you have a look at it, you have the, the earlier scar here, uh, and you have the surgical scar on this side. So these are the very difficult, challenging, challenging uh, cases where you have to be prepared with, with something other than the normal medial parapetalar or subvastus sub or just a tibial tubercle osteotomy. So these are the very useful tools. Uh, probably one has to see that uh, it is not a very osteoporotic. If the bone is very osteoporotic, probably tibial tubercle osteotomy may be avoided. Probably the soft tissue exposure is, is, is done in a better way. Quadriceps snips is the first method that one must try to expose a difficult knee. And then one must decide that when you have, when you release proximally sufficiently all the scar tissues, you must decide that yes, you need to go now. You have to work distally now 
on the tibial tubercle, where you have the two options, whether you do a tibial tubercle osteotomy or you do a uh, banana peel. And both are very good options with their own limited indications. Thank you so much. So thank you, uh, Dr. Rajiv. Uh, yeah, so there is a question from Dr. Akesh. Uh, how do we decide if you need a quick snip, quad snip, or a tibial tubercle osteotomy? Raj Kumar, would you like to take it? Yes. Hello? Dr. Raj Kumar? Raj Kumar, you have to unmute probably. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, no. I wanted to ask a question to Ashit. So is it I'll ask now or? Yeah, you year. ask your question and give your answer, whatever suits you first. Well, I didn't hear the question. Oh, the sorry. question is, Rakesh has asked that how oh, to sorry. decide if you need a quad snip or a tibial tubercle osteotomy. Which one would you go for? A proximal uh, a quad snip or would you go for a TPO? So in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a really completely a stiff knee, rheumatoid situation or where there is no flexion at all, I would go for a tibial tubercle osteotomy. I, I also equally perform a quadriceps snips also very, very commonly, particularly in revisions. So in fact, my tibial tubercle osteotomy is more in a, in a complex primary situations, post-traumatic situations and stiff knees than in a, 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 a revision scenarios. In revision scenarios, first is my preference will be a quadriceps snip, which is also very easy and also very good uh, approach. But in a complex primary, if there is a situation where the uh, patient is really stiff and uh, post-traumatic, there is a chance of very high chance of petal tendon to be peeled off. I prefer a tibial tubercle osteotomy. So, in either case, uh, do you have a problem when you, if you have, uh, you, you have anticipated a patellar jump sometimes when you do a, a TTO or no, uh, yeah. no, not at all, not at all, no. Yeah, carry on, yeah. please. So the, because because you are fixing it in a correct position, see that's what you you keep it in extension, you align it properly where the petlar tendon uh, sits properly, the osteotomy bone. The only thing is it is it will it will not have any tension. The whole tendon will not have any tension because you are um, suturing it back in extension. Only if you suture it back in flexion, then you will have the problem of mal alignment but here you are fixing it in extension so you will not have any issue at all of, of course all this petal are uh, jumping and all those things also matters with the, your rotation of the components and your other uh, uh, technical things so if you if you proximally migrate your osteotomy a little bit won't it go and impinge on your joint which you are actually putting in it is a problem sometimes which we no that's what that's what i told because it is not too much so if you have if you have done if it migrates too much that means your lateral sleeve is also gone it is almost your the whole petal tendon is tangling uh, even before that is where i said if you take the saw through and through it goes up it uh, uh, gets peeled off that is why the lateral sleeve is very very important both in vascularity and also it prevents the migration so yes, initially, I was very hesitant to do this, but when stiff knees, I found it very, very comfortable because no issues of petlar avulsion, tendon avulsion, or petlar peeling off the bone, the tendon peeling off. The two things are avoided with this. The case which I showed is a rheumatoid patient, the post-operative extension, short lady, female, rheumatoid, completely stiff knee. So the extension is very good now. Your question. In, Vikash, if I can uh, come in here. Yes. yes. Uh, the, the three things. Uh, one is that the uh, tibial tubercle osteotomy in a stiff knee uh, can be shifted a little bit proximally to gain the, the advantage of the leg ligamentum petli uh, length. And you can shave off the proximal uh, about a centimeter or centimeter half of the uh, tibial tubercle, uh, the, the, the segment which you are lifting up. So effectively, you are lengthening the ligamentum petrally. You are shifting it proximally. Second, you can fix it in these cases in a little bit of flexion, uh, like uh, what Rajkumar was just mentioning. It is right that in a patient where you have the movement, the, the full extension and full uh, reasonable flexion, it may not be a major issue. But the patient where you have a stiffening, uh, the flexion is limited, you can uh, probably choose uh, fixing it up in 30 degrees. 
and as far as the fixation of the tubal tubercle is concerned, as long as the lateral or the medial uh, structures, if you're going for the medial approach, the lateral structures, if you're going from the lateral approach, the medial structures should remain intact, periosteum intact, because that is a very big stabilizing fragment. And uh, uh, if you are not entering into the medullary cavity by, by when you are doing the tubal tubercle uh, uh, osteotomy, uh, then probably extension stem may not be needed, as we were discussing a few minutes back. Yeah, in, in a complex primary situations, very rarely you will uh, breach that. Only in revision scenarios, you will be breaching that uh, proximal tibial bone. But whereas in a revision, already you are going to have a stem inside. So that will not be an issue. But in complex primary, very, very rare to breach it. And it won't be an issue. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, in, in about, uh, say, 95% of cases, you get away with the cordyceps nip only. Yes. And uh, require a tibial tubercle osteotomy or, you know, uh, osteotomy is a must when the cement is extending down, where you need to take out the cement or you have already a stem extender in situ where you need to take it out. So they are better to go ahead with a tibial tubercle osteotomy, you know, primarily or from the beginning. Yeah. So the, uh, the question now uh, to ask it just a quick question. So always we, we, uh, we are taught and we also teach that tendon to tendon healing is good, but in your approach, you're almost cutting the muscle and then re-suturing it. How, what is that? Uh, is it really uh, the healing is uh, better or the pain management? How is that? You showed all your videos, excellent videos, good flexion extension immediately next day. But what about the suturing of muscle to muscle? So if you saw in both the videos that I showed, the, if you proximally, there is a muscle, which is a superficial layer and the tendon is a deep layer. So typically as Kenneth Bramlett described that you have to do a double layer repair, that you have to do a tendon to tendon repair first, and then on the top of that do a muscle repair. So that is how you get the approximation. However, the way I have been doing it this way, that you take one single suture, muscle from one side, tendon, tendon, muscle and then repeat it second time and then tie it. So they, there is hard, it's a very watertight closure and there is tendon to tendon that approximates nicely and on the top of that muscle comes. Muscle along with it brings the vascularity. So the healing is very good. Now, unfortunately, sometimes if I have to revisit this cases, say three months down the line, if I have to open for something, maybe for infection or maybe for uh, poly change or something, I myself in my own cases cannot make out where the arthrotomy was. It heals so beautifully well. Are you with me? That's one. Yeah. 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 So, so, Thank and you. then, you know, obviously with the better pain management, with surgical skills that we all develop over a period of years and using the modern implants, they are able to get to that particular range of movement and uh, post op rehab. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ashish. There is a question from Dr. Gopal Shinde saying, uh, what is the power after Q-SNP and what is the rehab protocol? Any would, anybody would like to take it? Dr. Rajiv? Uh, Dr. Subhanshu? Yeah. Quadriceps uh, uh, SNP uh, uh, is, a, is the most commonly used uh, technique in a stiff knee and it probably should be done first. And important thing is that, that the, it has been shown very clearly that when you release proximal, uh, proximally, the uh, quadriceps strength is not affected as much. As much it is affected when you are working distally, whether you are working distally on the tibial tubercle or doing the banana peel. Uh, so probably the, uh, the uh, if, if one has to choose between the two, probably the quadriceps snip uh, is definitely the first, first procedure that one must try. Uh, and the uh, rehab protocol uh, is that uh, you must use the, uh, the uh, knee mobilizer for a period of three weeks uh, for walking. Otherwise, you can leave the patient to do the function, whether it is a tibial tubercle osteotomy, quartz of snip, or it is the banana peel. Well, what a quick question to Dr. Mohan, please. No, for, uh, you know, for quartz snip, it is routine rehabilitation protocol. Yes. No yes. change. Yes, yes, yes. No change. You can no immediately change. make the patient to walk and stand and start knee bending. Everything is routine. Doesn't affect at all. Yes. Last question. Dr. Mohanty took yeah. uh, the in uh, regarding this quadriceps snip, 
in a in a case of petla baga it is okay but in, sorry in petla alta but in a petla uh, some cases preoperatively we will see the inferior pole of the petla already sitting on the tibial condyle in those situations if you are doing a quadriceps snip it still more affects the petla so it yeah. is very difficult to again pull back the petla down so in these kind of situations what will be your suggestion PTO is better. That will shift your patella. If you're yes. proximally shifting the patella, then tibial tuberculostatum is better choice to, you know, to at least correct the patella bar to certain extent. Hmm. Yeah. Raj Kumar is answering his, uh, yeah. uh, his own, his own uh, intended questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Like, yeah. That is also... That's it. But yeah, a okay. Question yeah. to... Question to Nilen. Nilen, uh, you were doing this um, uh, subvastus using tourniquet and then after some stage you stop using tourniquet. So question number one, has it made any difference in your exposure? And question two, if subvastus is so good an approach that you know it does not uh, alter the quadriceps mechanism at all, why not? Why still it's not very popular? I mean, what is the problem? You know, what do you think? You know, you uh, communicated to so many surgeons, you've been giving this talk to so many people. And I think Ashit, Ashit, unless you see it repeatedly, see looking at one video is not going to convince anybody. Right. And although you say that it has not become popular, I think of all the people who have worked with me, there are some five or six fellows every six months who work with me. So everybody who works with me eventually starts doing this because they can see the advantages and they have seen loads and loads of knees being operated by like this. Uh, so it is a question of faith. So if you believe that you can do it, then you will be able to do it. So secondly, what was the other thing that you tunique. were asking? Tunique, you, you were using earlier yeah. and then you stopped yeah. after some tunique, time. Tunique, I don't know what has been everybody's experience, but one fine day under Tunike, I had a vascular injury, which I did not pick up. So I just point blank said that from that day onwards, I would not, I have not put a Tunike on on anybody, no matter what surgery I'm doing. Uh, and fortunately, that was the time when tranexamic acid was just coming in the picture. And I've been using tranexamic acid since 2007, 2008. So I've had extensive experience of its use. Plus we have published extensively on various combinations of tranexamic acid. And I feel Tunike is the biggest kind of eye blinkers that orthopedic surgeons have. And uh, if you stop using the tunique, the results can be much more spectacular. Pain can be much less. Has it made any difference in exposing your subvastus? That was my question. No, 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 no. no. Not it's at all. It's more easier because, you know, you can bring, the, you can manipulate the cortices better without the tunique. Because tunique is holding the proximal, uh, you know, the muscle. And yeah, then distally you are trying to manipulate. It, it is fairly proximal. It is fairly proximal. And the thing is, you know, I have not used a tunique since, you know, maybe 12, 13 years. So I've forgotten what it was with a tunique. Right. But I, I see the point. There is one other question that I want to ask to uh, Rajiv and Rajkumar uh, regarding the TTO and uh, the banana peel, if I may. May I? Yes, yes. Yeah. So my feeling on this is that if the bone is severely osteoporotic, as it is in some rheumatoid patients and non-ambulatory patients, although Rajkumar has shown the TTO extremely well, I think it is fraught with danger because for osteotomy to heal, you need a good quality bone. And probably in those cases, a banana peel may be better. Do you all agree? Or do you think that uh, my assessment is yeah. wrong? No, no, no. Actually, both are very good. The banana peel also. But in this one, in TTO, I say not in all rheumatoid. What Dr. Rajiv showed was not a very stiff knee where there was no flexion at all. It was not in that situation. What I showed was a completely stiff knee, a straight knee where even you cannot even expose the knee. This procedure is mainly for the exposure. Sure. So that... So sure. that was the big advantage. So what, the only point I'm making is that if the bone is severely osteoporotic, should no, you do a soft tissue procedure or should you proceed with a bony procedure? That's what I'm asking. Yeah. Uh, that, that is again the surgeon's uh, experience, I will say. 
Yeah. If uh, I can give my view, yeah, Rajiv, uh, I agree that what you are saying is that if the bone is very osteoporotic, uh, I would probably uh, not go for a tibial tubercle osteotomy, uh, uh, unless uh, because the bone needs to heal well and it, it has to uh, sort of uh, uh, the, the inherent uh, the the native bone strength is important. But I think that I use the screws most of the times in fixing the tibial tubercle osteotomy. And what I see that Rajkumar is using the the uh, number five ethyl bond. Ethi Probably bond. that may, may be one of the change uh, that may be uh, making the Rajkumar's cases comfortable. And I agree with Rajkumar that in a, in a extended knee, in an ankylos knee or a knee in extension, Probably a tibial tubercle osteotomy is a far better better approach, but as as much as possible, uh, probably the proximal release is more easy and more better from the quadriceps strength point of view. What would do you say? That, that would that kind of osteopenia really bother you, Nilan? Because we see so many osteopenic patients with fracture, we fix them, they heal. They don't generally go into any non-union or anything. It's the stability and the reduction and the implants that you use. Those osteoporotic patients also heal so well. So, would that really matter you? You know, the question that you asked that in uh, these osteoporotic bones, you know, TTO, the TTO will not heal. Probably, I, what do you think, Rajkumar? No, no, that was that was the point I was about to mention before uh, uh, Rajiv's answer. See, the, here you have to follow whether the bone is osteoporotic or non osteoporotic, 1 to 1.5 centimeter thickness and 6 to 8 centimeters of length. That is more than enough for the bone to heal, whether it is osteoponic or anything. So the only issue is the fixation is the one which was very scary. Screw fixations definitely have got high complication. Once I started doing this etibon, definitely it is so advantageous. Still now, touch wood, I have not seen cases. I have not had cases with the breakage of this uh, osteoma. Even when you are taking that osteotome and lifting the whole uh, uh, fragment, Sometimes that it may not come in full thickness. It might sometimes come in a little bit of a small chunk with two chunks. But once you resuture it, it all heals very quickly. So no issue. Next day flexion. See in metal hardware you use, we put them on the brace, we avoid flexion, we restrict so much. But with the ethibond, in, in fact, you know what? Once you uh, use the ethibond and you start flexing it, it actually gets tightened it. It, the fixation gets secured very nicely because of the petla tendon tension and the good component position, everything falls in place. Like as you flex the knee after a total knee, you see that petala sits on the femoral component very nicely and securely. Like that, this tendon gets tightened with the ethi bond. So no worries at all. Well, one question in the chat box from Dr. Dr. Gopal Sinde to Milan Vai. Uh, I, th I think it's a, he has shown it that uh, in Valgasni, do you do subbust or subpoach? I think he has published it. Yes, yes, yeah. He, he showed it. Yeah. yeah. My, my... Dr. Mohanty, if I may just add, yes, yeah. medial subbusters definitely can be done. And I have even done lateral subbusters with tubal tubercle osteotomy from lateral to medial. Especially when there is lateral tibial implant which is there or there's a stem component which needs to be removed. Uh, I just wanted to ask another question that I know you can do it uh, TTO with subvestus approach, but proximally you can't do anything like quadriceps snip and all, correct? But you don't need a quadriceps snip. If you mobilize the quadriceps from the medial intermuscular septum, a quadriceps plasty is inbuilt in the subvestus approach. See, if there is a stiff knee where you are not doing a knee replacement, you, what do you do? You do a quadriceps plasty. So that is clearing the medial gutter, the lateral gutter, lifting of the vastus intermedius. So all right. that you can do with the subvastus approach. So what I hear you saying, Dr. Nilesh, is that uh, you, you can, uh, you, sorry, uh, Dr. Shah, that you can keep going up and up no matter how you want and with subvastus and in case of very stiff knees, difficult exposures, you would go more proximally and make incision longer and do it? Yes. Yes. So that is what the trick is. If somebody is fixated to the idea of a standard incision, probably that would become a difficulty. If you just expose a little bit more and take the quadriceps further up, I think we can avoid and we can follow what you are saying at this point. Yes. Yeah. 
Okay. I is Manoj around? I... Manoj is there? Small last question. Manoj is Manoj gone. Manoj is a busy man. Manoj, okay. I don't think that is around. Intercity traveler, I think, today. So, <laughs> <laughs> I think he, he must be busy. So I think he must have left. Okay, I think we are well beyond the time. So, Actually, yeah. So we can uh, end our webinar here. So, um, first of all, let me extend my heartfelt thanks to Dr. Vikas Kapoor for, uh, you know, organizing all the, the wonderful webinar, which is very helpful for the beginners and most of us also, we gained a lot from this webinar. Thank you, Vikas, for organizing this webinar and uh, with all this excellent, wonderful faculty. Thank you. And uh, would thank Smith and nephew also. For we thank Smith and nephew also for their support for this webinar. And in the background, Dr. Swapil Kenny, uh, who is assistant professor at the said GS Medical College and KM Hospital and uh, controlling this whole show in the background. Thank you, Sapni. And uh, now all these 20 webinars which have been conducted during last one and a half years or so, they, that the recorded, you know, video recordings of these webinars will be giving as a gift to the delegates who are attending IACON 2021 in a pen drive. So it will be a ready reckoner for all of you whenever you are performing a surgery. Suppose FFDE, just go through the FFDE webinar. Suppose you want to see a TTO, just uh, listen to Dr. Rajkumar's lecture for uh, five, 10 minutes before, you know, surgery. It will be immediate ready reckoner will be very helpful for you. Uh, dear friends, uh, now, Next month is our IACON 2021. So next month, we won't be having any webinar. From November onwards, Dr. Rajiv Sharma, who is our president-elect, he will take over from me as a president of the Indian Arthroplasty Association during the annual general body meeting next month. And uh, from November onwards, he will be conducting the webinars. So we welcome Dr. Rajiv and uh, for the you know, academic show, which will continue. I am sure that with a dynamic, you know, academic personality of uh, Dr. Rajiv Sarma. You will enjoy all the webinars uh, for the years to come. Now, thank you, so thank you. Thank you all and have a nice evening. Thank uh, you. Thank uh, you. Uh, just a quick last yeah. word. Uh, in the last, uh, first uh, lockdown uh, in the month of uh, April 2020, we all in the EC decided to uh, start this webinar uh, series. In fact, the IA was the first one uh, it, to start this and uh, initiative and it was it was taken very well by everybody and it all went without any hitches for this i would really appreciate my sincere thanks and congratulations to dr mohanti our president who took so much of personal uh, efforts to organize every single webinar even though we all we all helped in convening one one webinar individually but it was mohanti's individual efforts which has led to this kind of success. And I think everybody will accept uh, that uh, this uh, uh, effort by Dr. Mohanty. Very good. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Rajkumar. Thank it's you. All, uh, it's all team, team effort, I would say. You know, it's all team effort and that effort will continue in future. It's an initiative. No, but your Scientific. initiative was very helpful. Yeah. Your initiative yeah. was yeah. very, very important. It's an initiative, but it will, I'm sure it will continue. And, uh, you know, I all, will flourish. All, all soft smilers are silent killers like Dr. <laughs> Mohanty. He has killed it <laughs> very well. Well done. Well done and wonderful work. And I'm Great. sure Dr. Rajiv, who has been such, a, such an inspiring uh, uh, talker in all these webinars, is going to lead us from the front in next uh, year. Uh, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. And a uh, lazy man like me has been, you know, spanked on the back to run a webinar, which has been a, a real achievement from Dr. Mohanty. Thank you. And I look forward to much more in future working with all of you. Thank you very thank much. You, thank, you. thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. May, may I request the EC to remain, whoever is uh, from the EC is remaining. The rest of you can, you know, log out.